But let me briefly introduce our speaker and also we have a wonderful uh, uh, discussion. Uh, someone uh, who uh, really has also engaged with this, these issues, both within South Asian context but also from a uh, US perspective. Uh, Mr. Tom uh, Graham. So first on Neil. Neil, uh, as many of you now know, he is the author of Beyond South Asia, India's Strategic Evolution and the Reintegration of the Subcontinent. Uh, just got published by uh, Bloomsbury. Uh, he's a geopolitics fellow at the Takshashila Institution. Uh, currently, I just learned that uh, you are actually uh, in New York now, based in New York, working with the city government, helping to get New York City get richer. <laughs> it's better managed uh, economic affairs, that's the way I understand. Uh, he was recently a fellow at uh, Harvard University, Kennedy School of uh, Government, and he has published widely uh, in the uh, Atlantic Foreign Policy, the Journal of International Affairs, uh, National Interest, the World Affairs Journal, Huffington Post, uh, EPW, uh, and many others. Uh, he's also a former foreign affairs columnist at the Christian Science Monitor and South Central Asia commentator for Russia Today News. So I'm really delighted that you, know, uh, you are here with us to uh, talk about a topic that is very dear to me uh, on, on multiple levels, you know, uh, especially you know, uh, at India-China Institute, we are interested in looking at India-China story from a broader perspective, and I think uh, your work uh, will help us get a better understanding of uh, what's happening and how things look in the future. Uh, briefly about uh, Dr. Graham, uh, he uh, is someone, as I said, you know, really uh, knows the region quite well. Uh, he has uh, worked in the government, U.S. government, especially with U.S. Arms Control and Disarmament Agency, U.S. Department of Energy, uh, Brookhaven uh, National Laboratory, and also he has worked with a number of non-profit groups, uh, Rockefeller Foundation, uh, the Second Chance <coughs> Foundation, um, and he has published widely, written uh, numerous articles on U.S. national security issues, uh, nuclear non-proliferation, counterterrorism, and public opinion. He is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and the Cosmos Club in Washington, D.C. Um, I'm really delighted that Tom, you could join us share your thoughts, both on what you know, uh, Neil will uh, share with us, but also just add your own thoughts on what's happening in the region. So on that note, I'm sorry that I don't see uh, much progress on the laptop front, but I, I trust that you know, Neil will uh, you know, still give us a very you know, uh, uh, insightful uh, uh, thoughts and ideas on what's happening here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank everyone. How's everyone doing today? Thank you so much for coming out. Um, it is so exciting to see you here. Uh, I think some of you I've, I haven't seen in a while. Um, and the last time I, I saw you, I was saying, I was telling you, well, you know, I have this idea for a book. And here we are. Um, first, let me thank Ashok and Mark and Tim and everyone who's been at the India China Institute for having me here, for hosting this. Um, Thanks to uh, Thomas for, for joining us, uh, my, my editor Matt, and everyone at Bloomsbury for making this happen. And really, thank you. Um, seeing you here and everything just makes this whole journey very worth it. Um, so I, I did have some pictures, but mostly there, there were a lot of maps to uh, make everything make a little more sense, because there will be some geography. Worst comes to worst, you all have iPhones, you can just Google Maps. And the, uh, <laughs> Anyway, this is a very interesting time for India and India watchers because the new Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, uh, just spoke twice, just in New York City this week. Once he was at the UN General Assembly, and another time he, he spoke to a packed, uh, basically a rock concert at Madison Square Garden. Um, and he also apparently hung out with Hugh Jackman and started quoting Star Wars with him, um, telling him, may the force be with you. Uh, I'm not sure why, but that did happen. Uh, so he's certainly been meeting a lot of folks in a very short amount of time. 
And in fact, in one of his first acts as prime minister, he wound up inviting uh, all the leaders of the South Asian countries to his swearing-in ceremony. And that included Nawaz Sharif, who is the prime minister of Pakistan. Now, most folks know that India and Pakistan have, for decades, been, been a textbook case of political hatred, of conflict. So this was a move by Modi that seemed completely unprecedented. But in a way, it was sort of just a throwback to Indian history. Let me explain that. Uh, who here has been to India or South Asia? And who here has been to Delhi, the capital of India? Great. OK, so Rashtrapati Bhavan is the president's house in <coughs> India. Uh, and right around there is the, it's the seat of most of the, the Indian government, um, which most visitors to the city come to see. But just yards away from Rashtrapati Bhavan is tucked away in a small little garden enclave is the Bagh e uh, This is a, a little garden, it's a little garden park that's a mausoleum to the Persian language poet named Abdul Qadir Bedo. Bedo was born and, and bred in today's India, um, and he was a revolutionary poet in 17th century India. He mixed Hindu and Muslim and Turkic and Bengali and Persian themes in all of his work. Now, I'm not surprised if none of you have seen this spot, uh, because very few people in India today have even heard of Bedo. But his name and his poetry still carry a great amount of currency in Central Asia. In 2006, the Tajik president, Imam Ali Rahmanov, respectfully came to India and placed a plaque on Bedo's Indian resting home. Pakistani scholars consider him to be the most pioneering poet of the Persian language. The Iranians, they host international annual conferences on Bedo's literary contributions. And even illiterate Afghans, they throw up their arms in delight when they hear some of Bedo's poetry. Now, reverence for Bedo speaks to the centuries of exchange between South Asia and Central Asia. Because having been isolated by the sea on the south, east, and west, and by the Himalayan mountains to the north, um, Central Asia had always been India's door to the outside world. Invaders and traders from Alexander the Great to Nadir Shah and Silk Road merchants and Sufi Muslims, they all use these northwestern routes uh, to access the Indo-Gangetic Plain, this, the heartland of India that goes from Punjab in the west to Bengal in the east. And the Afghanistan-Pakistan border, which has been in the news a lot the last couple of years, uh, it wasn't the militant abyss that it is today, but it was a corridor of communication. And it was that connectivity that helped make North India one of the most fertile, populous, and even wealthy parts of the world at the time. <coughs> but a few centuries later, by the time India became independent from Great Britain, uh, the region was partitioned into nearly seven different geographic entities. These were India, West Pakistan, East Pakistan, which later became Bangladesh, um, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, and Sikkim. Now, partition severed all of those trade and cultural connections that had long integrated South Asia. <coughs> but either way, uh, the, because of this new situation, the leaders of the new country of India remembered that even with a small little foothold in the region, foreigners were able to take control of the entire country. In the case of the Mughal Empire from Central Asia, they controlled just a little bit of land in the Northwest before they took on the rest of the country. And the British, they just settled in, in Bengal and Calcutta in the East before colonizing the rest <coughs> of the region. So to protect itself and assure against those footholds, India came up with something that it called its Monroe Doctrine. This meant that it was gonna try and keep the subcontinent internally united and insulated by denying the autonomy of India's smaller South Asian and also by denying any, the foreign countries any sort of presence in the region. Now, India's socialist command economy would be one way of accomplishing this. A centralized economy would unite the region economically, and import substitution would make it so that India wasn't dependent on any kind of foreign companies or economies. And in foreign policy, India didn't want to join either the Soviet Union or the US in the Cold War, so it started the non alignment and the non-aligned movement basically said, all right, Soviet Union, US, you guys want to fight? That's cool, you do your thing. But we don't want to be a part of that. 
Applied to South Asia, though, that meant that no foreign powers were allowed any access to the region. That was going to be India's domain. Unfortunately for India, uh, Pakistan, the other large independent country in South Asia, quickly rejected India's ideas. Uh, Pakistan's very existence broke the unity of South Asia because the country of Pakistan was created to provide autonomy for the Muslims of the region. Second, Pakistan went on to join the Central Treaty Organization and it signed a mutual defense pact with America. So it brought American weapons and American money and American attention to South Asia. And Pakistan even cultivated a strong relationship with China uh, in order to balance against India's power. So for the next few decades, India and Pakistan fought four wars and dozens of other skirmishes, if not more, based mostly around the disputed region of Pakistan, uh, of Kashmir, excuse me. In 1971, all of these factors culminated when the people of East Pakistan uh, rose up against their, their rulers, and India helped the Bangladeshis to create their own independent country, severing it from the rest of Pakistan. In retaliation, the Pakistanis used the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979 to build up this huge militant and, and, and military infrastructure along its western border. Now this was an operation that was funded by the United States and by Saudi Arabia, mostly with the intention of fighting against the Soviets. But it also wound up targeting India as well. Uh, the Indian states of Punjab and Kashmir were soon both aflame in conflict and violence, most of which had been sent over from the border from Pakistan. And we're still seeing a lot of the fallout from that in today, in, in all, all those countries. So by the, in response, India just increased its own defense spending throughout the 1980s, deploying it around the subcontinent, in and along the border with Pakistan, in Sri Lanka, along the Chinese border, it even enforced an economic blockade of Nepal, largely to demonstrate its own control. So by the end of this, India and Pakistan were caught in this cycle of violence Afghanistan had become a quagmire long before the 2001 invasion. And the countries of the region hated each other so much that they couldn't even cooperate on challenges like shared water resources. They hardly traded with one another. And they armed themselves to the teeth in order to fend each other off. Essentially, South Asia ended the 20th century in deadlock. In 1991, though, India experienced a major financial crisis. In response, it initiated a huge economic liberalization program, and its previously closed economy was opened up to foreign investment. Largely as a result, India's economy exploded. By the early 2000s, its growth rate reached 7%, and by the middle of the decade, that number got up to 9%. Now, to put that into context, we're lucky in the US if we hit three. Public and private Indian firms were starting to move beyond the borders of South of, of India to reach new markets, and energy and market access became central means for India. At the same time, though, China's economy also began to expand, much faster than even India's. China became the biggest world, the world's biggest producer, and domestic construction exploded. And in order to fuel that growth, China needed to access Middle Eastern and Central, energy, Central Asian energy resources, but also to control the trade routes to those resources. So it started to create little stepping stones to the rest of the world, cultivating relationships around Asia that folks have taken to calling its string of pearls. Now it's constructed a naval base uh, just at, at Hainan Island in the, in the South China Sea in order to fend off US control of the South China Sea. It's building a canal through Thailand and a rail line through Burma so that it can transport goods by circumventing the South China Sea entirely. It's developing the only energy pipelines that exist in Central Asia in order to import Kazakh and Turkmen natural gas. And most consequentially for India, it's developing a naval base in Sri Lanka, just to the south of India, at the center of the Indian Ocean to try to gain control of that region. And of course, its military presence is expanding in Tibet which is right along the border uh, with India there. So as you might imagine, uh, the Indians have been getting pretty damn scared. But as a result of their own need to balance against Chinese, 
China's growing presence, and also to access new markets and new sources of energy, India is looking beyond South Asia, you know the book, <laughs> for its strategic needs. Now, in the early 1990s, India articulated its Look East policy, where it would re-engage with the countries of East and Southeast Asia. Singapore became India's largest source of investment. India started to build roads to link its own northeast states to, to Myanmar. Uh, it's taking up joint naval exercises and increasing trade with Japan and Australia. And it's even helping to strengthen Vietnam's navy. India has also started to look west. Its trade in oil, in natural gas, in food, and low-skilled labor with Saudi Arabia, with the Emirates, with Qatar, even African countries like Sudan is, is exploding. And in conjunction with Iran, Afghanistan, and Russia, India is trying to develop a new Silk Road through Central Asia. It's got energy deals with all of the countries of the region. It's developed an air force base in Tajikistan, which is three countries above it, basically. It's hoping to develop two natural gas pipelines. It's pledged over $2 billion of investments in Afghanistan. Um, it's constructed the Afghan parliament building. It's training the Afghan police. And it's building a vital new highway in Afghanistan's west. But probably the most important thing for all of South Asia and, for, and Central Asia is that India has developed a road <coughs> that goes from the Chabahar port in eastern Iran all the way to Afghanistan's western border. The Chabahar road and rail are meant to help India access these investments in Central Asia. But even more consequentially, it's opened up a whole new way to access Afghanistan. For centuries, Afghanistan had been dependent on Pakistan for access to the sea. This had been bad for Afghanistan because it had to be reliant on another country for all of its economic activity. It's been bad for America because we've been forced to depend on the Pakistani military for access to the region. And it's even bad for Pakistanis themselves because they're feeling the fallout of all of these dependencies. But this new Indian construction, constructed road may start to kind of change those, those regional power dynamics. To access and protect all of these investments, though, India has been expanding its navy as well uh, to, to a blue water one, one that can reach distant shores more easily. And in order to push back against China's presence in the Indian Ocean, New Delhi is developing Port Blair in the Andaman Islands, right in the middle of the Bay of Bengal. So you see, China is dependent on the tiny little strait of Malacca that passes between uh, Singapore and connects the Bay of Bengal to, to the South China Sea for almost all of the trade. But with India's navy right there at the mouth of the Strait of Malacca, uh, India can easily stop any Chinese ships, so strengthening its own hand against Beijing. And this is one of the main reasons that India, that America is so interested in India these days. Because by helping India develop its navy, the U.S. comes closer to its own goal of countering China. <laughs> and ever since the U.S.-India nuclear deal, uh, that in many ways was sort of a symbol of the two countries' new partnership, the U.S. and Indian navies have actually been more coordinated than almost any other bureaucracy. Uh, they've probably been more coordinated than any other military in the world. So, as you can see, in an effort to access resources and markets and to balance against China, India is moving beyond South Asia for its strategic needs. So what does all of this mean for India's relationship with Pakistan? As we said at the beginning, the India-Pakistan relationship is, is a textbook case of political conflict. It's supposedly even more intractable than Israel and Palestine. Well, even with regard to Pakistan, India's own goals have changed. Now India's aim is to keep a safe, peaceful, and stable investment environment in South Asia, to access markets and resources, and to offset Chinese influence. So as a result, India is being much more conciliatory to its South Asian neighbors. It's moving most of its navy away from the coast of Pakistan and towards the Bay of Bengal to confront China. It's moving its army's land forces away from Pakistan, towards the north also to confront China. And it's even looking to increase trade relations with its supposed mortal enemy. Because according to some models, some economic models, trade between India and Pakistan could be 50 times higher than it is right now. 
So recently, both countries extended most favored nation status to one another. And India agreed to sell oil from Gujarat to Pakistan. And in fact, and this could be a game changer, India is unilaterally restructuring its energy industry in its western Punjab state to sell petroleum and natural gas products to both China, excuse me, to both Kashmir and to Pakistan. Because these days, Pakistan is actually more afraid of domestic terror <coughs> and of the United States than it is of India. Do you guys remember the Bin Laden raid in 2011? So with the Bin Laden raid, the US showed that it could, and it would, brazenly infiltrate Pakistani territory. And this is something that even India has not done in decades. So Pakistan's trying to be a little more friendly with India so that it doesn't have to fight both of them at the same time. Now, I'm, I'm, look, I'm not saying that a full peace or friendly relations are necessarily inevitable, uh, particularly given that the, the two countries keep accusing each other of supporting terrorism. But I am saying this, that with Pakistan more focused on the West and India more focused on the East, the Indian and Pakistani militaries are at the very least starting to ignore each other. And this policy of mutual avoidance uh, could open up some political breathing room for stronger trade relations. So road, rail, electricity grids, and pipelines, they're retracing the ancient Grand Trunk Road that ran from Kabul in Afghanistan down to Dhaka in Bangladesh. Plantations in one country are producing goods that are processed and manufactured in another. Onions, tea, agricultural products, tech, and even services and labor are flowing across more porous borders. Even joint water management projects are providing irrigation to multiple populations and helping to cl manage climate change. Of course, any realization of this sort of, of reconciliation between the two countries will require a lot more time and space. But Indian statesmen have always dreamed that ease transportation and trade would be so strong that travelers could have breakfast in Indian Amritsar, lunch in Pakistani Lahore, and dinner in Kabul. Maybe they ought to bring along a copy of Abdul Qadir Vedil's poetry to make that journey even more pleasant. Thank you. in the next short period of time. And so we have a, a fantastic study that is looking forward but drawing on the diverse political strategic culture, primarily of in India. And I think Neil has done a fantastic job in laying out what it might look like looking forward where you're aware of the past, but you're not bogged down by the past, and it's not completely putting you in boxes that the region has been in uh, since independence for both countries. And so what I wanted to do was to commend the book and the presentation, because I think that America has a very unusual relationship with South Asia. And that the one, the one area where I may differ a little bit with Neil is that invariably, Indians perceive that America cares more about India than Americans actually care about India. And that relations between the United States and India, which are, which are relatively good now, throughout this whole period, <coughs> India may have ranked on the American higher, global hierarchy of interests. It might have been seventh, it might have been twelfth, it might have been twentieth, but it's never been the top one, two, or three. <coughs> And I would argue that even in the face of the growing threat from China, I'm going to go into that in some detail, that I don't think that fundamental relationship is going to change. America and India can be, will be closer. There will be areas of, of cooperation. There will be areas of, of 
sharp disagreement. But that from the American perspective, if America is relying on India to be a major balancer of China, as a strategist, I think that that is not a good bet. Despite all of the American foreign policy experts who argue that that's a good move to do. And I, and I do that for three reasons. First, India is not now a world-class military power. And in 50 years, it's not likely to be. If you use the standard of a world power as to be able to, to dominate the oceans, if you look at all of, all of what's required and you use Britain and the United States as the benchmarks for a navy that was able to exert influence all over the world. And the level of investment that's, that will be required in order for India to dominate those regions is, I think, way above what even the most conservative hawks in India are arguing. I just don't think it's in, I don't think it's in the cards. I think that you can have a presence you can build up forces enough so that, so that it deters China from doing something that's a very, very low probability of that. But to be able to have the amount of political power that the conservative strategists in India hope for, I just don't think, I don't think it's in the cause. Let me mention the nuclear program as a perfect example. <coughs> Recent scholarship in the last 10 years in India has been much more honest about the history of India's nuclear weapons program. Nehru talked peace, Nehru talked disarmament, but in fact his private instructions to Baba was to build an infrastructure to be able to produce electricity and nuclear weapons. And, and Nehru from the very, very beginning was making his decisions based on hard-headed calculations of India's actual power and how long it would take India to build up the capabilities to have an impact. So if you assume that India has had a nuclear weapons program for about 50 years, contrast that with China. From the date when the Russians reneged on their agreement to provide China with all the technology to build nuclear weapons, it took China less than 10 years to go from mastering the enrichment capability to build nuclear weapons to testing a fission device for which there's no debate on what its yield was, to developing the next tier, which was called boosted weapons, to developing thermonuclear weapons, to be able to, to deliver those on both bombers and missiles and test them in less than 10 years. So if you're looking at nuclear weapons as a, as a currency of power, China succeeded in a relatively short period of time. India does not, does not have a credible <coughs> global nuclear force at this point. Now, I'm not arguing that that's, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but I'm saying that fundamentally, up till now, when allocation decisions have been made in India on resources, that all political parties and Indian bureaucracies have always put domestic <coughs> economic development ahead of foreign policy, <coughs> military, intelligence, the like. And I don't see Modi changing that dynamic at all. And so even with the, the fundamentally different Indian economy, which this room shows, that, that when India was, on, was during the Cold War, it was heavily aligned towards Moscow. But then what started to happen, in my, in my experience, was that Indian men and women who were studying in the United States as the internet just started to become real were communicating back to their families, particularly of senior government officials, and saying, look it, you've blown it. You picked the wrong horse in the Cold War. You've lost that. You have to fundamentally transform what you're doing. And much of what Neil's talked about is a result of the transformation of the Indian elite from being pro-Moscow, pro-Soviet, to being much more global, more focused on the United States. But I think fundamentally what's driven that is the domestic economy. It's domestic technologies, it's education, it's civil sector, it's all, all kinds of things. It's not on the military side. 
And I think that, that in fact, the, the fundamental choice that Modi is going to have to make is he has a very strong part of his own political constituency that wants him to develop, five, develop 500 nuclear weapons, develop capabilities to be able to cover all of China, to ramp up the Navy. I mean, there is, there is a, a large body of work by people who are strong members of the BJP who want him to go down the path that realism argues you should to be a major power. This is what you need. You need to have all these military toys. You have to control that. You have to worry about that. I would argue that if he goes down that path, there's no way he's going to be able to accomplish his, his economic and cultural goals, <coughs> and that, that he can't do both. And that up until now, what he has done is that he, he has adroitly opened the door of conciliation with inviting leaders to, it, to his inauguration, to, to talking to China, to talking to the US. But that what he's going to actually do with the resources is going to matter fundamentally. And that what I would argue, and I completely agree with Neil on this, is that if India chooses to be more conciliatory towards smaller countries in the region and is able to show in domestic Indian politics that giving a little bit more water to Nepal in the long run is in India's interest because that opens up the ability to generate more electricity. And the similar things can happen in Sri Lanka and, and, and Bangladesh. And if you start to have a much more, I would say, flexible India, that that's in India's own national interest. But what's going to have to happen is Modi could pull that off just as Nixon could go to China. He can actually deal with the right wing within the BJP. So he has an, op he has an option going down that path. But if he chooses and he focuses on the China threat, and my argument is, and Neil is one of the very few people who say in print that he thinks that the China threat to India is exaggerated, and I completely agree with you on that, that, that then that's going to sabotage his, his own goals on the domestic side. And so what you're going to see is, in the next couple of years, he's going to have to make decisions. And he can't, and he can't do both. Last point that I would make is that I think that if you look at the level of interactions between India and the United States, at the people-to-people -people level, at the technical level, at, at even the economic level, vibrant, interesting, creative, but at the government-to-government -government level, it's still Cold War-esque because in the Ministry of External Affairs, you didn't get ahead in that bureaucracy if you didn't make sure that every time any possibility came for Indian flexibility with its neighbors, you actually wanted to squelch that at the very first opportunity because you didn't want to be seen as being weak. And so in the, in, in the US, usually the more aggressive people are on the military on the Pentagon side. But in India, the, more, the hawks are actually in the Ministry of External Affairs. They're not in the Ministry of Defense. It's a very interesting difference. And so one of the structural problems that India is going to have is that the people who you need to actually be more flexible than others are from a bureaucracy where everyone in that bureaucracy has been socialized for the entire time. So the people who are getting ahead are the much more aggressive people on it. And so Modi's going to have to transform the Ministry of External Affairs into a problem-solving institution rather than, rather than um, and that's going to be, I think, the, the tactic that's going to be the most difficult for him because he's not a Delhi creature and he's not. Let me stop with that and uh, commend you on an excellent book and one that integrates not only geopolitical issues but realizes that, that for the next 50 years, issues of water and global warming are going to be the ones that actually will drive the agenda and, and the longer it takes India and the rest of South Asia to get out of the old agenda and adopt the new agenda, it's in their own self-interest. And one thing I would commend you to do to look at is the last previous Secretary of Energy, who was a Nobel 
uh, laureate, ethnically Chinese, went to China and gave a presentation at the Chinese equivalent of MIT. And it was on global warming, and he didn't say anything about the United States or the world. He just talked about what impact global warming would have on China. And the person who introduced him was his aunt. So here he comes in as a Nobel Prize winner. His aunt introduced, introduced him. He, he had the cultural symbolism absolutely right. And so the people at the, at, at the university had a problem because they couldn't keep this speech bottled up. So they allowed it to be on the network within the university, but they didn't let it go beyond that because it was an example where he tried in, in a sense of using his scientific knowledge and his cultural understanding to make a major, major point that was completely threatening to the government, but completely open to all the people who were in this audience. And it was a, it was a really interesting thing that he tried, and, and it had a level of sophistication of communication across countries and others, and you might find it really interesting, because it, once he gave the speech, it didn't go anywhere in China, and he couldn't get the Obama administration to understand that focusing on a new agenda was the important thing to do as opposed to, to continuing to fight on the old agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. I think uh, you have certainly added a lot, and I'm sh I think what I would like to do now is have Neil, perhaps, you know, yeah. respond to yeah. and you know, add some more thoughts, and then we will open up for Good. Sounds good. Um, thank you, Tom. Those were really interesting thoughts. Um, <coughs> first, I think, was the idea that India is not a world-class military power. And in a sense, I definitely agree with you. Um, but in another sense, I don't think that's, a, that's an issue, per se. Because, at least for the, from the perspective of the United States, in hedging China and all that, um, India is not going to be the only partner. It's going to be the partner in the Indian Ocean. And I think insofar as that's, that's the extent of our expectations, of American expectations, it's, it's a valid one. Um, given India's geographic assets, um, I wish I could have pulled up this map for you to, to bring to life that uh, the, the Port Blair thing, because it, it really shows just how how much of a, an influence on geopolitics, just that one little ability to close off China's international trade could be, could have. Um, so I think, in so, right, I, I completely agree with you that, that the right wing of the Indian military hawks that want to say, you know, we need to project power to Africa, we need to project power to Latin America, they're absurd. They're completely absurd. Um, but insofar as the Indian Ocean is kind of the new near abroad, their neighborhood, um, I think that's, that's a more realistic expectation. Um, and on that, that question of domestic policy versus military power, uh, I have a colleague uh, at Takshashila and Nitin Pai who always says, what should our Pakistan policy be? Economic growth. What should our China policy be? Economic growth. What should our U.S. policy be? Economic growth, um, and so I think that the correlation between domestic changes and international influence there it's it's much more direct. Um, the there doesn't have to be a trade-off in that same way, and particular another theme um, that I, I try to explore in the book is is how India's own governance has affected all of this. Because just the, the natural economic geography of the subcontinent is one that's very decentralized. You know, you'll have like, you'll have, for, for centuries, it, it's always been, um, you know, the, the Punjabis have this area, the Gujaratis have this area, the Tamils have this area, the Bengalis, and so forth. And every political entity has been that way for centuries. But it was only in the last 50, 60 years that it, even, excuse me, even under the British, 
it was one, technically, one big empire, but there were thousands of little nations within that. Um, it was only in the last 50, 60 years where Nehru said, you know, we need to have it under centralized control under New Delhi for all these, these reasons in modern doctrine. Um, but in the last 10, 20 years, and, and I assume going forward, and it seems like the, the case is going forward, all these things are decentralizing again. Um, the same forces, you know, the chief minister of West Bengal can put an end to a foreign policy initiative like the, the Tista River. Um, and the same with the Punjab chief minister, he can put an end to a foreign policy initiative because he has control over you know, that border region. Um, and, but in, in another way, that's generating some more of that economic activity and it's, and it's, it's generating that growth. And it's also generating a greater understanding of those cross-border linkages. Um, I think more than any, more than the last two or three generations, the Punjabis in Indian Punjab are saying, oh, wait a minute, we need to integrate with Pakistan and Punjab for our own benefit. And that's a big part of that decentralization. Um, and lastly, totally agree with you on the people-to-people -people contacts with the US and India being good being solid, but the government contacts being this legacy of the Cold War, where uh, the Indian administrative services have this kind of reflective, oh no, we don't want to partner with anybody, we, we, we want our autonomy. And the American institution saying, look, you're either literally with us or against us. You're either a strategic partner who sends us military, who, who joins us in every military mission that we need, or you're not. So I think even the U.S. is trying to figure out where, where to put India in that. And just one comment on that. From the American problem, the problem is if you're a foreign service officer in the United States and you want to become an ambassador, the problem is South Asia is the last place you want to start your career on because you don't have the upward mobility in terms of numbers and positions within the bureaucracy to be able to go from a brand new foreign service officer all the way up. If you're, if you're focusing on Europe, you're focusing on, on East Asia, you're focusing on, on the Middle East, you're focusing on other parts of the world, the career incentives are in fact not, not to do South Asia. And so you get a situation where most foreign service officers don't know a lot about India, and then you have people who have served in the region, they know enormously amounts about it, but they're not likely going to have much power within that bureaucracy. So that it's, it's not just the Cold War context, it's the institutional structure, where when you get to the people, the people, and the education, people get rewarded by the amount of knowledge that they have, and the contacts, and all of that. And, and that's where things are really blossoming. And, and so it's going to be very interesting, um, I think, to whether Modi is able to, who, who understands the cultural dimensions, whether he's able to actually play the cards and do more than a, a, a glitzy rock concert at Madison Avenue, which is fine, but to turn that into something that's actually more, more sustainable. I think he's more likely to do that than on the Americans. Yeah, I think let's, let's expand the conversation and see whether people have any comments or questions. We'll go for that. Yes, please. Please identify yourself. You know. Hi, uh, my name is Ashwin Kalbak. Uh, I'm uh, a friend of Niels, but uh, I just wanted to ask a question of each of you. Um, my question to Niels would be, what do you uh, see the role of expatriate Indians uh, in shaping uh, Indian policy? Because we have a lot of context to give to the Indian government. I'm not sure they're all going to be receptive of all of that, but uh, I just wonder what that would be. And my question to uh, Tom would be, um, why is it that India is so low in the US uh, uh, list of priorities? Because, I mean, clearly, uh, our uh, congressmen and senators here uh, have uh, much stronger opinions of Israel than they do about India. And we are you know, a significant power, significantly more powerful than Israel, if, if you want to look at it, uh, 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 you know, uh, another country in the, in the neighborhood. Sure. Um, I'll take that first one, uh, about the role of the expat Indians in, in Indian foreign policy or in the two Yeah, system? and both actually, because I think, um, I do agree that the, the U.S. policy also needs to sort of 
change a little bit. They're mired in the past to the same extent in some ways that the Indian policy is. And this, uh, obviously, they, you know, your description of uh, you know, the career-orientedness uh, of uh, or the structural problems with the careers of uh, foreign officers, uh, you know, um, I guess diplomats, etc., uh, is just stating the fact sort of that the U.S. is more Eurocentric than it is eastward looking. Well, the role of expat Indians, I think um, there, there has been a big role already. Um, I mean, in, in the U.S., there's, 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 through most of the Cold War, there were only two narratives about India. One was that it's a socialist backwater with all it has is poverty and disease, no work our time. The other one was um, India is a pain in the ass. Um, it, uh, it, it has nuclear proliferation. It doesn't help us on, in the Cold War. It doesn't, you know, it gets in our way in, in Afghanistan and in China, everything. Um, but it was the role, it was the idea of India as a market that was, that had its origins in Indian diaspora communities, in the United States, in the UK, and even in Canada for a little, for, to a little uh, extent. And in the 90s, Indians in America started to organize politically, and you see the culmination of that with this, this Modi rock concert, that, which was mostly organized by South Asian Americans here, or Indian Americans. Um, <coughs> And it was, they caught hold, they created this narrative of India as, um, as a market, as a place that was ripe for, for economic liberalization. Um, and then, in many ways, passed that back to, to Gujarat, to Bombay, to New Delhi. Um, so that's one way that it's already been happening. Um, but now the conversation, I think, is, is changing a little bit. Because the, the first generation of South of Indian Americans were probably a little more to the economic left than the the new generation of excuse me to the economic right than um, the new generation of Indian Americans is. Um, so how that'll play out and how that sh shifts back to politics in India. So, uh, to answer part of this question is one of the things that I find in Washington. Is if I look at the executive branch and Congress, because the Indian American diaspora has made it here on America, what you find is that the 30 to 40 year old, you have large numbers of Indian Americans throughout the executive branch everywhere. So they, br they bring a level of knowledge that a foreign service officer who's been there for a couple of years, far more than they do. So I think what's happening, it's having as much of an impact on the US government as it has on the US government. Because because they bring a deeper understanding of, of the region. And so you're moving generationally from white Americans who went to learn Hindi to people who grew up in a Hindi household who then made it in America based on merits, and then they can actually speak across both countries. And so I think you have not very long before they're going to move into decision-making positions. You already have the Assistant Secretary for South Asia's Indian Americans. So, um, on the question you asked me, um, the problem with the U.S. is, is the U.S. foreign policy, while well, it may have a grand strategy, it may have had it in the Cold War, it doesn't have one now, is essentially fighting fires. And so what happens is that it's not that people sit down and say, gee, on a rational list, where should India be? It should be 37. It's not that, but it's that the first crisis is on one continent and the other crisis is on the other continent. So American, the, the attention of the American foreign policy bureaucracy gets stretched in many, many different different relations and then it oftentimes focuses on South Asia when something really bad might happen, the war between India and Pakistan, and then there it gets into hyper mode to try to calm that down. And the other the other reason is that there's a little bit of a disconnect from the Indian and American side because um, India is still coming out where the government has a much bigger impact on the economy than it does in the United States. And so Modi comes and says he wants you know, trade and all this. Well, the U.S. president, no businessman, cares at all about what the U.S. government is doing about economics. It's, it's, it's Wall Street, it's other parts that run business. So the, the systems are, it's very difficult for them to actually right. communicate because they're structurally different. He did actually address that uh, in his recent speech where he said that you know, the Indian go his government would try to, uh, to push the 
uh, economic drivers into the public sector rather than, uh, sorry, into the private sector rather than be in the public sector. Mm. We'll get back to that. How about you, sir? So, okay. Uh, my name is uh, Siva Das. Uh, I'm actually a retired UN official. Okay? My background is not geopolitics, it's development. So, uh, so my question is, uh, to, I'm posing it to both of you, okay? uh, because Thomas, you talked about the need to move beyond the old agenda to a new agenda, uh, and the new agenda being an agenda which uh, might be heavily dominated by emerging issues, no longer emerging actually, such as climate change. You see. And uh, here you see, you know, uh, observing, uh, observing the, the positions taken by both India and China in the United Nations on uh, climate change discussions, uh, it emerges, you see, that uh, both countries are still unwilling, so to speak, you know, to assume global responsibilities when it comes to, to climate change. Or rather, both are arguing that, uh, that yes, it's a global problem in that, I mean, neither India nor China is denying climate change, unlike many Americans, if I may say so. Uh, and many important political forces in America are denying climate change. That is not the case in China or India. So there's no denial in the scientific sense of climate change. Uh, that being said, uh, the, 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 the political powers in the, in, in the country, in the two countries, are not as yet willing to undertake full-fledged uh, global responsibilities in dealing with this problem, which requires a global response. So anyway, I mean, I don't want to go on and on. Would you like to comment on this issue, both of you? Um, my take on this is that, uh, right, for the, for the reason you're saying, a, a climate agreement at the international level is just going to be very difficult. The Indians and the Chinese say, look, you industrialize, you other countries have been industrializing for hundreds of years, and now you're making us pay for our current development with, with because you did that? No, I'm sorry. Whereas, of course, the Americans are saying, yeah, but why should we control our economic growth now if... Um, if if you don't have to either, so I'm I'm actually very cynical about about climate change movement on the international level. I'm a lot more optimistic about it on the local level, on the local and even domestic national level. Um, even though India, for example, had been digging its heels in at Copenhagen and in, at every climate negotiation, um, Jairam Ramesh, the former minister of forestry and environment and number, he had a big portfolio. He finally said, look, I don't care what America does, I don't care what China does, because climate change is hurting Indian people. It's, 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 giving, it's making our air polluted, we can't breathe. It's making our water so that we can't drink. So we have to change it for our, for our own sake. And so with that, um, I think it was in 2010 or 11, right after uh, Copenhagen, right before, right in anticipation of Copenhagen, they said, all right, fine, we're going to increase, excuse me, reduce our carbon intensity. Um, and we're going to take steps to make sure that for every dollar of growth, we produce less, uh, fewer carbon emissions. So that was one thing that happened on a domestic level. But I think another huge change that's going to affect the whole climate discussion, the whole discourse in India and globally, is urbanization. Um, because on one level, as people are moving to cities and people are developing, cities. There's going to be a lot more construction. But at the same time, urban dwellers in, in, in the industrial world consume a lot less uh, carbon dioxide, excuse me, emit a lot more carbon, a lot less carbon dioxide than suburbanites and then, then people who live outside cities just because of the, the scale, uh, the, the returns to scale of urban growth. Um, so I think that and even at the city level, we're seeing so many more changes. I mean, just like last week, right here in New York, the mayor said that um, New York City will cut its emissions by 80% by 2050. Uh, that's not something we're seeing anything, we're not seeing anything close to that at the national level in the US. 
But we're seeing that in New York, we're seeing that in Seattle, we're seeing that in San Francisco, we're seeing that in Copenhagen, we're seeing that in Beijing. So I think that gov I think that all governments on climate change are are way behind the power curve. And if you if you look at the individuals who were developing the world class science um, behind climate change, you've got Indians, Chinese, you you got I mean and so what's happening is that I think that, that at the academic level, the scientific community is thoroughly multinational and is way ahead of governments. I think that smart businesses are actually second. And one of the things that I see is starting to happen only among liberal, Amer liberal American economists. They're actually saying, well, actually, if you look at the math, the more you invest in energy efficiency now, the more efficient it it's actually makes money. It doesn't cost money. And I think that what's going to happen very quickly, given that, given that, um, in terms of world-class economists, India probably ranks first in the country in terms of numbers of world-class economists, is that if the economic new conventional wisdom becomes that, that, that addressing climate change is, is good for business and it's good for utility and welfare, that then you could see things quickly and governments will, will, will be working hard to catch up, and the U.S. was probably going to be the last one because of the political power of the vested interests here, where I think, where I think in, in, I think, I'm more optimistic that, that, that useful things are going to happen in South Asia than I, than I am in China, because they've got some other problems to, to deal with that they don't have the mechanisms yet that they can deal with. Uh, I think before I ask someone, I'll just use the opportunity to just, uh, hear a bit more of your thoughts on two set of questions. One is really uh, more the how-to part, right, you know, in terms of how the policy making occurs, uh, at least in uh, India vis-a-vis -vis its region, right? Uh, a lot of people would say, I would argue, that if you look at the, uh, you know, uh, I guess, you know, very limited progress they made on Lucas policy, right? And then one would say, what happened? So basically, in Indian case, there are four entities that deal with policy making when it comes to foreign policy, right? It's not MEA only, right? MEA, PMO's office, raw, and defense ministry. And then depending on who has upper hand and depending on how those dynamics work, then I think they can either delay or they can really send mixed signals, including you know, on the China issue. So I think there's all kinds of debates. So I'm just wondering with Modi's arrival, with you know, his uh, uh, numbers, political numbers, do you s foresee any change in the way the foreign mal policy in you know, a making would occur under Modi that would help you to really think about South Asia uh, as a region differently? I know he made a nice gesture by getting all these you know, leaders uh, at his inaugural. You know, so I think that's one thing that I wanted to just you to comment on. Second is really the more the meta question in some ways, right? I think one narrative that you have uh, shared with us is in some ways really, uh, it's more traditional in the sense that you are really, and Tom you know, added to that, you know, is looking at, yes, you know, in terms of military power and all of these, you know, these are really traditional way of measuring what you know, constitutes power and how do you use it, right? I think there are scholars and experts in uh, India now who would argue that, look, you can't really, if you go by that approach, it's basically, it's a, you know, you can't really catch up. And in, in some ways, Tom alluded to that, right? So you need to really rethink policy making. You re really need, need to rethink, you know, how India's role in the 21st century should be uh, defined and should be attained. Right. And there was a, a report about a year ago, a little over a year ago, uh, headed by or led by uh, CPR, Center for Policy Research People, Non-Alignment 2.0. So I just want to see you know, whether you have any thoughts on really rethinking you know, uh, relations and notions of what constitute power. Mm -hmm. Because in some ways, I think you know, uh, right now you're stuck in this idea of, OK, I have X number of names and you have so is, is that the way to go forward? Do you see any uh, signs, you know, under you know the way the Modi government, you know, is beginning to at least, you know, 
make some moves uh, that you see a possibility of a new way of wrestling with this. Mm. Both of you, actually. Yeah, sure. And then I think we'll get back to you guys. And that question about what power is uh, is very interesting. Um, I think one the previous Prime Minister Mohan Singh said that knowledge is you know the currency of global power in the 21st century. And that was, that was a little quixotic, but he was speaking to something very important that it's, it's not just the number of nuclear weapons that you have or how far you can send them. Uh, and even China's recognizing this because China's own military development, uh, to say nothing of its economic growth and its diplomatic heft, its own military development was saying, what do we need? It's not what should we have, it's what do we need. So if China was facing a, an American threat of, of ships in the South China Sea, they said, all right, we don't need to build 500 aircraft carriers, we need anti-ship ballistic missiles just to keep them away. So they did that. And then they would kind of do what was needed for each, for each specific challenge. And, um, and absolutely, when it comes to decision making, and how this new understanding of power will will loop back into how decisions are made in India. I think that's it's the same. That the more and more you decentralize decision making, um, and I mean the Indian Constitution did it in the early '90s, and they created more states in the late '90s in, in India to decentralize it even further. When you get decision making closer to the point of impact, um, you often get more pragmatic solutions because you're seeing a tangible result. Um, and so what will that mean for you know, power in South Asia? Um, I think on some level, the, and the BJP is very well known for favoring decentralization. They were the ones that carved two, three more states out of, out of uh, Madhya Pradesh and, and Bihar in the late 90s. Uh, and they, support, uh, they supported Gurkha land in, um, in West Bengal, the separation of that. And I think that when you do that, you get a better sense of, all right, well, for this state, for, let's say, for Uttar Pradesh, they need water sharing with Nepal. It doesn't matter what New Delhi says, but they're going to make it work. And you go to Punjab and says, we need energy exchange with Pakistan. It doesn't matter what New Delhi says, we're going to do it. My, my sense is that in the end of the right now, the PMO is more powerful than it's ever been, and that it's more powerful now, and, and that Modi himself is not somebody who likes to delegate. And so you have both personality and trend. Yeah. So if I, but I think that, that there's a problem because if Modi wants to be the Thatcher of India and wants to wants to get rid of the whole socialist economy and let let the free market and private enterprise go farther. That brings with it a decentralization. And so he's going to find, and, and so my sense is that I think on the global affairs, that's the last thing that you can keep very, very centralized. Where much of what else you're doing, once you really go down the path of, of economic pluralism, it's very hard to get that back. But but in the Foreign policy area, I, I think it's uh, the PMO is really the primary area, and in that way, it's it, it looks more like the U.S. national security, the White House staff, than than it did <coughs> five years ago. That's right. I think his current <coughs> chief, of national security chief, is a former Raw chief. So so I think it is interesting to see how all of that unfolds. You know. Anyway, I think uh, yes, sir. Uh, hi, uh, Arjun, Neil's cousin. Uh, as Pia and Neil and I are two favorite authors. <laughs> um, so I'm going to be a little greedy and ask you two questions. Uh, so the first one is, uh, you know, your, your, uh, your comment about the policy of kind of mutual avoidance or ignoring each other, how tenuous is that? Because, uh, you know, based on the articles you read, there's, there seems to be a question about who's really setting Pakistani military policy, right? Is it, is it the democratically elected government? Is it you know, the shadowy IOS, ISI organization, is it the military? Um, so how tenuous is that? And then my second question, I'm going to read your book, definitely, uh, but boil it down for me. Is it is now a good time to buy India ETFs? <laughs> uh, ETFs, uh, exchange traded funds. Is it a good time to buy stock? Uh, 
<laughs> Which one? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's a question that definitely comes up. Um, is it just now because of the whole war in Afghanistan that Pakistan is, is worried about putting that fire out? Maybe. Um, but I think the, the bigger thing is, is, is two part. First is that India is definitely focused away from Pakistan. And that will change the way the Pakistani military and the Pakistani national security establishment starts to see its own kind of threats. If it doesn't see as big of a threat from India, um, there, yeah, there are domestic reasons that it will continue to. But even this is opening up a space for a dialogue within Pakistan that has never happened in that country. There are people writing on the front pages of almost every single newspaper in every language in Pakistan, do we really need Kashmir? Why, why was Pakistan separated from India? Too? Did we, do, did we even need to have a country? There, there's this open space where Pakistanis themselves are asking questions that were for generations off limits. Um, and I'm not saying that that will necessarily change the decision making and the power structure, um, but it's when societies start to ask themselves these really difficult existential questions that like that lever is pushed a little further. Um, but I do think in terms of the more structural long-term stuff is that India is, India is definitely looking for their way, and um, that, that is enough to kind of change the dynamic a lot. But let me talk about Pakistan for a minute, because I, I've done as much on Pakistan as I have in India. Um, one of the most fascinating changes that's taken place in Pakistan is military, organiza military organization in Pakistan is the only thing that works in Pakistan. And once you get an expectation that the chief of army staff in Pakistan will only be there for two years, it means that the system, from a personnel point of view, is working the way it's designed. So one of the things that's happening is you get people who are at the colonel level, at the one star, and the two star level. In the last 10 years, they've been fighting Pakistani terrorists. And so there's a huge generation gap within the Pakistan military between Pakistanis who, have, who realize that the fundamental challenge to the Pakistani state is, is internal. And the older generation, which is, ah, it's India, it's India, it's India. So I think that over time, you're going to have a transformation in the Pakistan military. And while the domestic debate that you see in the newspapers is useful because Pakistan civil society is very fragile, and so any way that it can get stronger is a good thing for the world but that it's the change within the Pakistani military that's the most important. And that where this is going to, where, where the rubber's going to meet the road is everyone in India and Pakistan who's in a decision-making position are well aware that you get a major terrorist attack that India attributes to Pakistan, whether it's true or not, which then gets you to a, a flashpoint and a, and a crisis right away, that, that the, that's what Pakistan has to work very, very hard to make sure it doesn't happen. So for the first time you're getting throughout both the intelligence community and the Pakistan military, you get people who are arguing for restraint within the system where they have unquestioned authority and the civilians don't have it. And, and that's, a, that's, a very, that's a very good thing. And it may not lead to agreements between India and Pakistan or whatever, but it, it, if we can not have a crisis for 10 years, um, and we can let people see that the old elements of power are less functional, that then the natural developments that Neil's talking about have more time to, to progress. And so I think the next 10 years, separate from, from who's in office, is going to be very important. Um, and, and that, you know, it sounds silly, but every day you don't have a military coup in Pakistan is a good day. Because the more that that happens, and for, for a long time, being the person who worked at the UN, you know, many of the you know, people who developed the UN, UN development annual report were Pakistanis. 
who couldn't actually get the debate of guns versus butter in, so in, the, in their own country. So they had to come to New York and write a world-class publication, which for the first time tried to quantify across countries what human development actually looked like, because you couldn't have that debate in Pakistan and not having that debate in Pakistan. But it's, it's going to be more generated from the Pakistani side, and the Indians are going to be, are going to be react. And just hope that they don't, they're not forced to react, because what I fear the most is because this is a very strong part of Modi's persona, is a perception that you get into a crisis because if the other side thinks that you're weak, they may make a wrong move. And so if he gets into a crisis and feels that he has to show that he's tough, then if he starts to go down that path, that's going to regenerate the, the reaction on the Pakistani side. And the Pakistani military and nuclear program is no joke. And so you don't want to put them corner where they feel they have to use military power because that's the only option they have. Where India's got a lot of options that you can, you know, and India showed in, in the Kargil War that they could be very, very restrained at a, at a very high price to the, to the soldiers, but it actually unified the country and increased nationalism with, within India, and it actually showed India that they could be restrained, but they could actually gain credibility on the global scene for being restrained. So it was an interesting, interesting dynamics of saying being restrained actually gives you more status and more power in the international world. Yes. Hi, Tom. I'm a little confused about about having the deliverability of nuclear weapons being a measure of a really strong or credible defense in this day and age. It seems it seems a very to me personally preposterous to bomb your to threaten to bomb your neighbor you know, uh, with nuclear weapons. Did I misunderstand something you were saying? No, no, what, one of the things, and one of the things that I wanted to compliment Neil on in terms of the sources of people that he dealt with is because he read and talked with people on the very far right in India to people on the very far left. Not many scholars actually have this wide breadth, but in, in his book, he acknowledges and draws on the writing of a person named Bart Kanar, who was a sort of senior Indian strategist, who I think of as is still working in the Cold War mindset. And that is it's that faction of the BJP that have a view that, okay, Modi's is a tough guy. He showed, he showed that he's not going to be weak. We have to stand up to China. The only way we have to do that is militarily, so we should improve relations with Pakistan. This is Kanar's argument. It's not my argument, it's, it's from a, a sector of, of the Indian establishment that is supported by parts of the military and parts of the intelligence community within India. That, that, I'm not saying this is my view, I'm saying that there is, there is that perspective. And that- No, uh, excuse me, this had to do with the investment in whether you go domestic or, or into the military, you know, and, and then you had said something about that they had such an undeveloped uh, nuclear program in terms of the deliverability as, a, as weaponry that it's just so yeah. far-fetched that they would, you know. So, essentially, Modi is going to have to make an explicit decision either not to support people who want to build up the Indian nuclear weapons program in terms of its ability to deliver nuclear weapons. And one of the weird things about nuclear weapons is they're actually relatively cheap when you're doing the research and development. But when you actually translate that into missiles that you're actually building and systems and command and control, all that, they're ungodly expensive. And so once you, once you go from having a small number to a couple hundred, it gets really expensive really quickly. And so he's going to have to make a decision, which is, does he go down the path being advocated by some of his advisors that says, one of the ways we're going to deal with the growth of Chinese military power is to develop our own nuclear weapons. Right, but then what happens? Because they obviously can't use the, the, the nuclear weapons. I'm in complete agreement with you. And one of the things that, one of the interesting things that's happened is for people who do international security affairs is the Pentagon every year has to give an annual report on China. And they've actually changed the format in that report to the, under the Obama administration to provide less information in it than, than, it, than you were getting in the report in the Bush administration. Why, why, why is there less transparency in the Obama administration than the Bush administration? 
Well, the reason why it's less is, is that for people, who, for Americans who want to argue the China threat, the China threat, the China threat, the China threat, if you actually give, if you keep the same categories the same that you have in the report, it shows increasingly that there is no China threat and that, that, it's, that it's more hype than anything else when it comes to nuclear weapons. And so they change the categories and they change the color of their charts and they do all that stuff. But if you read, if you know how to read it very, very carefully and you read it with 50 other publications, you can figure out what it's actually <coughs> saying. It shows that, in fact, the Chinese made a decision a long time ago that they faced, in terms of the weapons, they faced both the United States and the Soviet Union as enemies. Mm -hmm. And they realized that a relatively small number of nuclear weapons is all you need. Mm -hmm. And that if, in, if Modi basically said, well, that was good for <coughs> China, so yeah, we keep up with the technology, but we don't need a lot of these things. To me, that would be a sign that Modi's actually very smart, because he's not disarming, but he's not over-investing in an old issue of power, because he has to keep the, keep the resources and focus on, on global warming and, and sharing water resources and, and and getting Indian companies to focus on new technologies so you both <coughs> make money and you also do a good thing for global warming, so you have a win-win. So, but that, that takes resources. So if you waste it on something on, on the old agenda, you don't have you don't have it <coughs> on the new Except agenda. Except ironically in this country as the economy grew, so did the defense budget. Well the thing in the US is is that is that because the basic economy, if you look at over a fifty year the amount of money as a percentage of the GNP that we spend on the military is way down because our econ the economy is so large that that's that that it's not really very consequential. That's that's not true of other countries, but it is true. I think we are almost you know, done with our time. So Atiba, would you? Yeah, I just have a quick question. Uh, my name is Atiba. I'm a student here at the New School. Um, and with the, in, with the difference in relationship between um, Pakistan and India, with this new um, <clears throat> brothership or friendship that is about to happen, as you mentioned, what do you think the role of um, India would be in Kashmir, like Indian Indians of Kashmir? Like, what it, yeah, because I didn't read the book, but I went to the index, and there's a lot of mention of Kashmir, but I was just wondering, what do you think the future mm -hmm. of Kashmiri people looks like, and also the relationship between India and Kashmir? Would that then look differently because of the connection between India and Pakistan. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let me read it. It's a really good question. <laughs> but in, to answer that quickly, um, I think that, that this is part of it. There, there are two themes that we've been talking about that I think are relevant here. One is the decentralization thing, um, that as states get, get more power relative to you know, the national government, um, that will also have a lot of meaning. Um, and another thing that, that was really important over the last 10, 15 years was in 2002, I think, um, the military leadership of Pakistan and the, oh, so between 2002 through 2007, um, and, and the civilian leadership in, in India started to talk about kind of a final settlement between India and Pakistan over Kashmir. Mm -hmm. They involved both the left wing and the right wing parties in Kashmir in that discussion. <coughs> and they came up with a number of parameters for what a peace would mean. And a lot of it had to do with um, water. Water is one of the big things that, that defines that region. Um, it sources almost all of Pakistan's rivers and almost all of the water that goes into their agriculture, which is their biggest uh, industry in Pakistan. Um, so, coming up with ways to deal with water, to deal with greater interconnectivity, to, create, to deal with greater trade across that whole region, um, I think that that's kind of the direction that things have been going. Um, of course, as, as Tom was saying, if, if there's some big, big change, um, there's some big crisis that happens, I still don't think that it'll derail it. I do think, though, it'll the train will stop for a little while mm -hmm. um, before it starts going again. Because these are these are goals that India, every every part of the Indian political system is committed to at this point. And, and 
unfortunately, the number of casualties in Kashmir has gone down quite significantly over the last 10 years. And uh, people I know who focus, Americans who focus on Kashmir, you know, are working on ways that you can try to soften the border so that, so that Kashmiris on both sides can interact more and you can use technology. So there's, a, there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of really interesting stuff going on with respect to Kashmir, but it's going on the non-governmental side. And unfortunately, you know, one of the only, personal opinion, one of the only good things about, about the last Pakistani senior military is, is they could only make a deal, only a military, only a chief of staff in Pakistan could make a deal on Kashmir. The civilians are not going to be able to do that. So unfortunately, the more you get democracy getting a toehold in Pakistan, it makes it a little more difficult to think that the ideas, which have been put on paper, Neil's absolutely right. They, they're, you know, th that agreement could be signed in 30 seconds if you had it in the political world, because the details have been talked about and it's been orchestrated in a very complicated way over the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. Well, unfortunately, we don't have much time, but I think I want to uh, kind of uh, point to one positive aspect of India-Pakistan relationship since we talked about water a lot. Really, if you look at in the region, <coughs> there are a lot of disputes, especially on trans, you know, boundary <coughs> water issues, whether it's Bangladesh, whether it's Nepal, you know, but I think one successful case of water sharing that occurs uh, is really between, sorry, between uh, India and Pakistan and Sopos. And surprisingly, it's also mediated by a, a multilateral entity, World Bank. So, so that's, you know, if people want to study that despite all these wars, they, that, that treaty it, you know, has been you know, effectively you know, respected and you know, managed. So, so I think there is you know, hope. And thank you again for you know, working uh, on this book and sharing this book with the wider world. And I want to thank all of you for coming to this uh, special talk. Thank, thank you. you.